Hi everyone, Dr. Mike here. In this video, we're taking a look at the hypothalamic pituitary ovarian axis, a really important conversation that allows for the production of important hormones associated with the female reproductive cycle. Let's take a look. To begin, we need to start with the brain. And we need to remember that if I were to draw the brain up, and you know that I'm an awesome drawer, so that's me drawing the brain, that's the front, that's the back, how good is that? That, there is gonna be an area right at the base of the brain around about here that we term the hypothalamus. I've probably spoken about the hypothalamus a million times in my videos, but that's not gonna stop me from talking about it now. In this scenario, the, well, in most scenarios, the hypothalamus is the master regulator of both the endocrine system, so hormones, but also the autonomic nervous system. That's the sympathetic, fight or flight, and parasympathetic, rest and digest. In this case, we're talking about the hypothalamic, pituitary, ovarian axis and its role in the female reproductive cycle. So what happens here is that the hypothalamus can actually have a conversation with a structure that sits below it. So I'm gonna make it look a lot larger than it actually is, where you've got the anterior aspect and the posterior aspect of the pituitary gland. So here we've got the pituitary gland, but you can see it's separated into two. I know it looks quite phallic, but just please keep going with me here. This is the anterior aspect, and this is the posterior aspect. What we're interested in here is the anterior, and that there's a blood supply that goes from the hypothalamus to the anterior pituitary. Now what happens uh, once a female hits puberty is that there's various hormones that are being released. One important one that gets released, particularly from the hypothalamus here, is that of gonadotropin releasing hormone. Gonadotropin releasing hormone. It gets released into this vascular supply, travels down to the anterior pituitary, where it stimulates the release of what we call the gonado tropins. Now there's two gonadotropins. There is what we call luteinizing hormone and there is follicle stimulating hormone. And they are named after what they do in the female reproductive system. That's great because that's what we're focusing on today. Luteinizing hormone, follicle stimulating hormone. Follicle stimulating hormone stimulates follicles in the ovaries to develop. I've done a whole video on follicular genesis, which I suggest that you watch. But basically, the oocyte or the egg that's sitting inside the ovary, it needs to be nourished as it goes through each reproductive cycle of 28 days. It's the follicle cells that do this, and they can only really do this if follicle stimulating hormone's been released. This is from day zero to about 14 that it's required predominantly. Luteinizing hormone is really required like 24 hours before day 14, because day 14 is ovulation, and luteinizing hormone stimulates ovulation. That's the release of the egg from the follicles that then get taken up by the fimbrae. Now, they act at the ovary, right? So we need to draw the ovary up, and it's important to know that in the ovary, let's not draw the ovary up actually, let's draw up two important cell types associated with the ovary, right? If we were to look at a developing follicle, so let's just say we've got an oocyte or an egg here, that as it goes through the developmental phase, that oocyte or egg starts to have cells associated with it. In its primordial phase or stage, you have a primordial follicle, and this primordial follicle has these pregranulosa cells. Then it continues to develop, and this oocyte, these pregranulosa cells turn into actual granulosa cells. So here we've got granulosa cells. And this whole thing isn't called a primordial follicle. I'm going to change that. Let's write primordial follicle. Let's call the next one a primary follicle, simply because that's what it is. So we've got a 
primary follicle here with these granulosa cells. Then it continues to mature, and as it matures, it gets more granulosa cells. Brilliant, but also starts to develop what's called theca cells. And so now we've also got ultimately two layers of theca cells on the outside here. So we've got theca cells and granulosa. Now you might be going, yeah, I saw you do this in your other videos. Why are you telling me this? I'm telling you this because this is now called a secondary follicle. And the secondary follicle will also turn into a ultimately turn into a mature follicle or graphene follicle, but the point is that you can see that the ovum sits within these follicles. That's the point I'm trying to get across. And ultimately, there's two cell types, theca and granulosa. They nourish the egg to keep it alive, but it's not the only thing that they do. Let's take a look. We've now released luteinizing hormone and follicle stimulating hormone. If I were to draw up a theca cell here, and I were to draw up a granulosa cell here, and let's label it, right? Granulosa, theca. It's important to know that theca cells have luteinizing hormone receptors. And that granulosa cells, what do you think they have? They have follicle stimulating hormone receptors. And so we've got FSH and LH, if we were to draw it like this, just so it makes sense. FSH, LH, and then I can draw it like that, right? What happens is that, for example, luteinizing hormone will stimulate the theca cells. It stimulates the theca cells to take cholesterol You've all heard of cholesterol before. Cholesterol is located with, in, is embedded with all the, within the cells, the cell membranes of all the cells of our body. It takes cholesterol and turns cholesterol into progestogens. Progestogens. You're probably thinking, do you mean progesterone? Yes, I do. Progestogens is the umbrella term that we use for progesterone, but also for pregnenolone as well. I said progestogens because it makes a bunch of different ones. It goes from cholesterol to progestogens, and it goes from progestogens into androgens. And androgens include things like testosterone and DHEA. But it's stuck here, it can't go any further, right? This is because a luteinizing hormone stimulates cholesterol to undergo the change into progestogen and then to androgens, but it can't go any further. So the androgens have to get sent across to the granulosa cells. And what the granulosa cells can do is they can turn androgens, again like testosterone and DHEA, into estrogens. And remember, ultimately, the estrogen that we are after here is estradiol. That's the important one that is involved in the female reproductive cycle. This happens because of FSH. FSH facilitates that. So I could, I know I'm doing a lot of wiping out here, but I could bring that down and put that arrow there and say that this is facilitated because of FSH. LH because of that. Now, Importantly, you might say, well, I know that granulosa cells also have receptors for LH, and they do. And you might think, oh great, that's confusing. But this is just for completion's sake. That can also stimulate cholesterol to turn into the progestogens. But it can't go any further. So it can send those progestogens across to there anyway. So at the end of the day, it's LH, theca cells, FSH, granulosa cells, ultimately combined, they work together to produce both estrogens and progestogens. And that's important because if we do the output here, this one's gonna be spitting out something like progesterone. And this is gonna be spitting out also progesterone. 
But what's the other thing that it's spitting out? Estrogen. Let's use another color here. What progesterone and estrogen do is they work on the reproductive tract. So I'll write this, sorry, I just hurt my knee. We're gonna put the reproductive tract here. Reproductive tract, you might be thinking, what are we referring to here? Many aspects, such as the endometrial lining. And so what the progesterone does and the estrogen does is they all work to positively facilitate. So there's, it feeds back and says, increase, right? Develop, become, when it comes to the endometrial lining, thicker more vascularized, start to develop glands and so forth. Now the other thing is that when you've got high amounts of luteinizing hormone, luteinizing hormone can actually feed back to the gonadotropins here. And FSH can also feed back to the gonadotropins here. And they can provide negative feedback, right? They can also go to so that's the gonadotropin releasing hormone. They can also go directly to the gonadotropins and again, provide negative feedback. And that's also for the FSH, provide negative feedback. Interestingly, here's an important point, estrogen can travel here and do a similar thing. So estrogen can also go and provide negative feedback if it's at low levels. And the same thing here. I know I'm making it a little bit complex here, but you can go to the gonadotropins and provide negative feedback if it's in low levels. But if the estrogen is really high, now think about this. Because the theca and granulosa cells are producing estrogen to facilitate the growth and development of the reproductive tract, the low levels inhibit FSH and LH, which make less estrogen and progesterone, right? That's interesting. Why would we want that to happen? Because as it feeds back, it's reducing FSH and LH, right? So FSH and LH drop back. If this cell produces a bunch of estrogen, right? Feeds back, goes low. What that means is it doesn't bind to these cells and these cells don't develop. They die off. What's left is a single follicle, a single mature follicle, which gets bigger and bigger. So for example, this one here will get bigger and bigger and thicker and thicker, and it's self-sufficient and produces itself huge amounts of estrogen. And the high levels of estrogen that this mature or graphene follicle can produce, if it's high levels, it positively regulates the gonadotropin release and it, uh, gonadotropin releasing hormone and positively regulates the release of gonadotropins. And then you get a spike of FSH and LH. And that's important because LH is involved in here. If LH levels go really high here, it forces this follicle to rupture and you get ovulation. So generally speaking, what we've got here, very briefly, is the hypothalamus pituitary ovarian axis. Hi everyone, Dr. Mike here. If you enjoyed this video, please hit like and subscribe. We've got hundreds of others just like this. If you wanna contact us, please do so on social media. We are on Instagram, Twitter, and TikTok at Dr. Mike Todorovic, at D-R-M-I-K-E-T-O-D-O-R-O-V-I-C. Speak to you soon.